message today is another in our Weird Stories from the Bible series. This one is called It's Too Easy. It's based on 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 to 14. Have you ever said something was too good to be true? Or maybe if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. There's some wisdom in that. If someone offers you something at an unbelievable price, you might want to check before you write your check. See what I did there? Sure, they may just be being generous or maybe they don't know what they have. And if that's the case as a Christian, you should probably tell them. But a lot of times there's a problem with the product. Either it's defective or it's just about to break down or else it's stolen and they just want some fast cash. Let's face it. We live in a buyer beware world. And with all the ways the internet has created to steal and deceive, it's just getting more so. Scammers are everywhere. And they're getting better at being bad all the time. There's a reason Jesus told us to be wise as serpents and to be gentle as doves. He doesn't want us to be like that old serpent Satan, right? He, but he does want us to be alert to the, to the serpent's schemes. And yes, he wants us to be gentle. He even wants us to be innocent, but he doesn't want us to be gullible. He wants us to use wisdom, the wisdom he has given us, and he wants us to be discerning. Yes, it's true. We need to be careful who we trust. But there is someone who can always be trusted. And of course, that's God. Yes, some things are too good to be true. But when God says something, we can always take him at his word. There will never be a time when God cannot be trusted. The question then is, will we trust him? The man from our story today is not a believer in our God. As a matter of fact, he's an oppressor of the people of God. That's part of what qualifies this as a weird story. His name is Naaman. He's a Syrian. He's a military man. In our day and age, we would probably say he was a general. He was the commander of the army of Syria. The Bible says his master, the king, held him in high favor. This was the king's go-to guy. If anyone would bring the king success, it would be this guy. It would be Naaman. As a matter of fact, he had just won a great victory for the king. He's called a mighty man of valor. In other words, he is a brave warrior. In their culture, he was a man to be admired. You might even call him a hero, but he had a problem. He had leprosy. He had a skin disease that usually brought with it a gruesome, awful death, especially in that time. For all his bravery and skill in battle, he was in a battle now with his own body and with a fatal disease. At this time, barring a miracle, he would not win. If something didn't change, leprosy would likely take his life. Look at what it says in verse 2. Now the Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. Now here's where this story starts to get even a little more weird, at least for me. I'm going to let you in on a little information. Now, it comes a little later in the message, but it's not really a spoiler. If you had been reading the uh, scripture reading before you went into this message, you would have already seen it. But God is going to heal this guy. And part of me wants to know why. I mean, look what he did. It looks like he led a raid against Israel, against God's people. And if that wasn't enough, he kidnapped the little girl and brought her home as a slave to his wife, almost like some sort of human battle souvenir. Somebody's little princess is taken from her home as a slave. Does this sound like the kind of person God would want to help? Would you want to help him? <laughs> I'm not sure I would. I'm sure there were some faithful Israelites who had leprosy that didn't get healed. But this kidnapper gets healing. It almost doesn't seem right. Now forgive me, but I'm setting us up just a little bit here. 
it may not seem right or even fair, but God is always right. And it's a bad idea for us as human beings to try to determine who deserves what. We don't always know what God is doing. We don't know all the details. Is what this man did evil? Yes. And please don't hear me saying anything different. I'm not supporting anything Naaman did. But in spite of Naaman's evil deed, we need to trust in the goodness of our God. We need to remember God always knows what he's doing. He is always right and he can always be trusted even when it looks for all the world like it's not fair and the bad people win. If you hold on to trying to determine who deserves what, this story is about to get worse for you. Look at verse 3. She, that's this little slave girl, said to her mistress, Would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. Now again, we know because we read the scripture reading, that's what happened. Naaman got healed. But now it looks even worse. If Naaman had not done the evil act of kidnapping this child, it could be argued that he would not have gotten healed. That almost makes it look like if we do the wrong thing, but good comes out of it, then sin must be okay, right? Perish the thought. No. We who love God need to love God, and that means we need to obey him. Now, the only thing this shows is that God is not limited by human behavior. That makes sense, because he is God, and we are not. And part of me wants to say God has worked through good people and bad people, except I can't really say that, because only one person has ever truly been completely good. Now, there's some incredibly good news here. Because while only one has been perfect, Jesus, many people who love Jesus try to be good. They struggle with sin, they might even fail and fall at times, but they love the Lord and they want to live to please him. I've heard more than a few people who love God but they think they can make a mistake and they can mess up God's plan. If that's you today, I want to tell you something that hopefully will lift you up a little bit, and it's this. You are not that powerful. There have been legitimately evil people who have openly defied God and tried with all their might to foil God's plan, and they have all failed. What makes you think that you, a person who loves him and wants to do well could succeed where truly evil people have failed. I'll say it again. You are not that powerful. Instead, those of us who love the Lord need to be praying for the people who do wrong and love people who don't know him yet. Look at the example of this little girl. She's been ripped from her family. She has been enslaved. Yet she tells the wife who enslaved her about someone who can cure her husband, Naaman. She works for Naaman's good. Why would she do that? She's pointing Naaman to the only one who can heal him. She's pointing him to the only one who can not just heal his body, but change his heart. Somehow, she knows what God can do through Elijah, or Elisha, excuse me, or she takes it on faith. And who knows what kind of change this healing could make in Naaman. So Naaman hears of this. And what does he do? Verse 4, so Naaman went in and told his Lord, that's the king, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. Here is how much the king favors Naaman. He's willing to send him to a foreign king with a letter of recommendation. More than that, he doesn't send him empty-handed. The rest of verse 5 says, So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, 
6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. Now, in case you're not up on your shekels and talents, let me help you. A talent is 75 pounds. A shekel is two-fifths of an ounce. So the king sent Naaman to Israel with 750 pounds of silver and 150 pounds of gold. That would be worth around $350,000 today. Though one source said all of that would have been worth about $5 million today. Not to mention 10 outfits of clothing. Remember, all the clothing at that time was handmade. It was all very expensive. These people didn't have dozens or hundreds of garments like a lot of us have. They had a few well-made, highly expensive garments. The king sent Naaman to Israel with a king's ransom. Ostensibly, the idea was he would pay off the prophet Elisha to heal his servant. The king sends all of this, and it's clear that he valued Naaman a great deal. Along with the money, he sent a letter to the king of Israel, which read, 2 Kings 5, 6, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of leprosy. Now, it seems to me there is a crucial piece of information missing in that letter. Did you catch it? Because the king of Israel did. In verse 7 it says, And when the king of Israel read this letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I a god to kill or to make alive? That this man sends word to me to cure a man of leprosy. The king of Israel thought the king of Syria expected him to heal Naaman. And of course the king doesn't think he can do that. He's a king, not a healer. And because he sees himself as unable, he starts to think there is an ulterior motive from the Syrians. He says, only consider and see how he is starting a quarrel with me. Now, the king of Israel was not totally wrong to think this way. After all, we see the Syrians had already raided Israel at least once. Not only that, but the Israelites, and especially their kings at that time, have turned their back on God. The man who was king of the northern kingdom was the son of Ahab and Jezebel, a man named Jehoram. And the apple didn't fall far from the tree, as they say. He was yet another in a long line of kings, evil kings. And to be truthful, it looks like Jehoram has reason to fear. But again, I'm looking at this situation as if I'm fit to decide who deserves what. This looks like disaster is imminent for Israel. But let me ask you a question. Which do you do first? Do you worry first or do you pray first? I'll confess to you that too often I start off with worry. I know it's wrong. But sometimes the voice of God is still and small and the culture and the people around me are screaming in my ears. Don took me to task on this the other night. I was listening to some doom and gloom report on the internet and she reminded me of something I already know. Sure, aggravating things are happening in our world. But God is on the move. God is at work and good things are still happening. Perhaps my focus is on the wrong thing at times. How about you? Jehoram is already tearing his kingly robes. He is in despair, and he seems to think disaster is coming. And Elisha the prophet heard about it. Elisha is a man powerful in word and deed. Elisha is a man of God. He is a prophet in the land of Israel, and a man who trusts God as completely as any human being could. Look at verse 8. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know there is a prophet in Israel. Is Elisha being boastful? I don't think so. I think he wants to show this man, Naaman, the power of God. I think Elisha wants to remind the king where his hope should be. 
And Elisha was going to do this in a way no one, including Naaman, could expect. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. Now think about who Naaman is before we go any further. Naaman is his king's right-hand man, the king's most trusted general. Naaman's a man who is in command. He is very powerful in his land, and he is used to getting whatever he wants. When Naaman says jump, people say how high. And maybe I'm reading this wrong, but it sounds like he shows up at the home of Elisha with a show of force. Multiple horses and multiple chariots. It sounds like he's not asking for healing, he's demanding it. Heal me or else. Do you know any demanding people? How do you respond to them? Let's see how Elisha does. Verse 10, And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. Okay, remember, Naaman is a big, powerful guy in his land. He shows up at the home of this prophet from a land he probably sees as less than his nation. Further, he probably thinks this prophet is beneath him. The God this prophet serves is inferior to the God of his land in his mind. But he has gotten to the point, Naaman has gotten to the point where he's desperate. This disease is a death sentence, and Naaman is running out of time. Still, Naaman is likely expecting Elisha to fall all over him. Instead, Elisha doesn't even come to the door. He sends a messenger to Naaman, and the messenger tells this powerful man what to do. The prophet he came to see didn't even dignify his presence by coming to the door. He sent some servant to tell this mighty general what to do. Go wash seven times in the river, and you will be healed. How would you respond? What would you do if you went to your doctor with a fatal disease and the doctor essentially didn't even come to see you, sent his nurse into the room and said, go jump in a lake. It had a sound like he was saying, if you take a bath, you'll feel better. Can you see how he might be offended? Now, hygiene is important. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Please don't get me wrong. <laughs> but taking a bath is very rarely a cure for anything, especially a serious disease like leprosy. What a joke. At the very least, Naaman had to think this was too good to be true, it was too easy, and in a way, he was right. Verse 11 shows his offense. But Naaman was angry and went away saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God. Notice he says, his God, not my God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. He's offended that Elisha didn't come to him personally, that Elisha didn't stand over him and pray for him, mind you, to a God he doesn't even believe in. Elisha didn't do everything people expect a man of God to do, and Naaman was ticked, he was angry. Never mind the fact that Naaman, again, is not a follower of God, Never mind the fact that Naaman only knew to come here because of a child, a child he kidnapped on a raid against God's chosen people, told him to come. He was an important person. He deserved to be helped because of who he was. Talk about an entitlement mentality. And folks, this is the other side of trying to determine who deserves what. And that's trying to determine what we ourselves deserve. When we start to judge God's goodness based on what we think we deserve, we put ourselves in dangerous territory. Frankly, Naaman deserves nothing from God, and neither do we. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Naaman's actions show he was undeserving, and yet we know God eventually healed him. Why? Because by his grace, God doesn't give us what we deserve. God gave his only son to take upon himself what we deserve so that we can become the children of God and live forever. Naaman's not done. He starts to complain about the river. 
The rivers in my land are better than the rivers in this land. If I could be cleansed by any river, it would be one of the ones that's close to my homeland. They're better, cleaner, purer, or whatever. Is that true? I have no idea. It all smells a little bit like pride to me, but maybe they were. He's saying, if I just needed to bathe in a river, I could have done that at home. He finishes his tirade by saying, could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. He's mad at Elisha, and he's mad at God. Why? Hear this, it's important. Naaman's mad because they didn't do, God didn't do, Elisha didn't do what he thought they should. How often do we do that? How often do we get mad at God because he doesn't do things our way? How often do we get mad at God because he doesn't do what we think he should do? When he doesn't act the way we expect him to, or in the time frame that we expect. And I know I say this a lot, but it bears repeating. If God can only be God, if he does things our way, if he does things your way, then he's not God in your life, you are. Naaman was going off on his tirade. And then someone did him a favor. Look at verse 13. But his servants came near him and said, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? How many of you know? It takes a little bit of courage to stand up to somebody who's losing it. Especially if that person has power over you. That's where these servants were. And yet, they were telling him the truth. This prophet gave you something really easy to do. He's telling you, wash and be clean. Now, I'll be the first one to admit, it does sound too easy. Wash in the river and be clean. I think sometimes we get caught up in that too. We expect things to be hard. But sometimes it's the easy thing. I remember at my former job, I called tech support because my computer was not working. Do you know the first question they asked me? Is it plugged in? <laughs> oh, I was mad. What do I sound like, an idiot? But do you know why they asked that question first? Because it's probably been the right question a whole bunch of times. And even if it wasn't the right question, it wasn't for me. It's the thing that supports everything else. So it's the first thing you need to check. On one hand, Naaman expected Elisha to come and pray over him and be healed. I have a question about that since Elisha served a God that Naaman didn't believe in. How can you be cured by faith when you don't have faith? I'm wondering if that is what Elisha was doing. Did Naaman need to act on faith to be healed? Elisha gave him something easy to do and he wouldn't do it. Maybe it seemed too easy. Maybe it seemed too good to be true. I wonder what Elisha had told, if Elisha had told Naaman to do something really hard for his healing. Do you think he would have done it? I do. I think Naaman would have moved heaven and earth to be free of leprosy. He was a man of valor. He would have taken any risk. But something simple seemed like it wouldn't work, so Naaman got offended and got angry. His pride was wounded by the lack of personal attention he demanded as a man in high position. Fortunately, he listened to his servants, his servants, and guess what happened? Verse 14. So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored, like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Now let's look at this. If Elisha had come out of the house and laid hands on him and prayed over him, who would have received glory for the healing? God or Elisha? Since Naaman was not a believer, I'm thinking it would have been Elisha. And if Elisha had given him some harrowing, dangerous task to do for healing, who would have gotten the glory? Naaman or God? I could be wrong, but as I look at that stupid thing called human nature, I believe Naaman would have looked at his healing and said, look what I have done. 
But now look what actually happened. When the servant of Elisha told Naaman to go wash in the Jordan, it seemed stupid. It seemed too easy. Washing does not cure leprosy. I'm sure Naaman washed many times, maybe even in those better rivers in Syria. And the leprosy never went away. That'll never work. It's too easy. And he was right, except for one thing. That command to go to the river wasn't ultimately from Elisha or from the servant. It was the command of an act of faith from God. Go do something that you don't think will work for no other reason than because I said so. And when he finally did it, he was healed. Now who gets the credit? Not Elisha. He didn't even see Naaman. Not Naaman. There was no great effort on his part. No, this could only work. This could only work if God made it work. And so God gets the glory. And because God got the glory, Naaman believed. Look at verse 15. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company. And he came and stood before him and he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So accept now a present from your servant. He stood there healed, amazed, and grateful. Naaman wanted to do something in return. He held out the fortune the king sent, somewhere between $350,000 and $5 million. Do you know what Elisha did? Verse 16. But he said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Elisha refused a fortune. Do you know why? I think I do. This might just be me, but I doubt it. Regardless, I think it's worth consideration. If Naaman gives the fortune, couldn't he say, look at the miracle I bought? Or look at the miracle the king bought for me. And if that happens, who gets the glory? Naaman or the king? But if the reward is refused, then the healing was a blessing from God. And that's what happened. Naaman came to faith in the God of Israel and was saved. If you don't believe me, look what he does next. Then Naaman said, if not, please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of earth. For from now on, your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any God but the Lord. He wants to have soil so that he can build an altar and offer sacrifices to God and God alone on the ground from where he was healed. And then he begs forgiveness for the work he still has to do on behalf of his pagan master, the king. In verse 18, it says, In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the house of Rimmon, that would be the false god of the Syrians, to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon. When I bow in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. He will still have to do his duties to the king. But he is now in the world, but he's no longer of the world. He has one God from now on. The one true God. Who knows? Maybe he went back to Syria and tried to be salt and light. And Elisha heard his plea and said to him, go in peace. Friend, in this world, there are many things that are too good to be true. But the best things in this world are the things of God and they are all true. He can be trusted and he answers prayer. Sometimes he asks hard things of us. But more often than not, he simply asks us to trust and obey and then walk by faith, believing. I think to this day, there are a lot of people who don't get Christianity because it seems too easy or too good to be true. They have a hard time believing in God, a God who simply asks us to believe in Jesus for salvation and eternal life. They act like prayer is powerless. And on its own, it is. The power in prayer is in the power of the one the prayer calls upon. But calling him into a situation changes everything. Eternal life comes from believing in Jesus, pure and simple. 
It all depends on him. And when he comes through, all glory goes to him. And when all glory goes to him, people are drawn to him. To God alone be the glory forever. Amen.